Um, it's nice to see a lot of friendly faces in the crowd. Um, so this talk is called The Red Balloon, Lessons on Community Building from the Public Lab. How many of you get the reference? Know the movie? Oh, you have to see this movie. Oh, I see a hand. It's a, a really, really lovely French film about a little boy and his giant red balloon. Um, and I'll come back to that later in the talk, but it's, uh, it, it's worth seeing. Um, I'm Dana Bauer. I have a background in geography and science, uh, and I've worked as a science writer, a cartographer, a data visualizer, a developer, a teacher, and a community builder. So basically, that just means I don't like to get bored. Um, my current job is as a developer and community advocate at Rackspace, uh, contributing to the open cloud, but primarily supporting open source software projects and open communities. So what do we mean by open communities? This is a, a, a discussion that I've had with some of my colleagues, so I thought that I'd try to explain that by an example. I'm going to talk today about one particular open community that I really admire and that I've been working with uh, for the past year. It's called the Public Laboratory for Open Technology and Science, uh, the Public Lab for short. They develop uh, and apply open source tools for environmental exploration uh, and investigation. The group was formed in response to the media blackout after the big BP oil spill in the Gulf. Does everyone remember that? I hope we all remember that. <laughs> it was a no-fly zone, and so the public lab Back then, it was called Grassroots Mapping, worked with a lot of community groups, including a lot of fishermen, to fly kites, fly balloons with cameras attached to them so that they could really gauge the extent of the oil spill. Uh, and, and as a group, they collected almost 700,000 images. Uh, and today, a lot of those have now been incorporated into Google Earth. And they did it with really simple tools and techniques. You can see here, uh, the kite has a camera attached to it, and they're just out in a little boat, boat in the Gulf. Uh, so the public lab really focuses on inexpensive do-it-yourself techniques. And their primary mission is to help scientists, researchers, community groups, technologists, non-technical people, be able to collect data about their own environments in a very low-cost way. And the public lab does this in a really hands-on way. They have a small staff, but they also engage a lot of volunteers to do hands-on work with different community groups, primarily in urban areas, but also in some rural areas as well. Uh, so uh, the, the tools are, uh, there are kind of a range of tools from very, very low tech paper maps. I'm a big fan of paper maps, uh, being a cartographer, to some more advanced experimental tools. Um, and really, this group is working at an interesting intersection of open technology, uh, open government, and, and public data collection. Uh, and a big part of their mission is to provide complete transparency in their data collection and data publishing process. So they're really very much a part of the open data movement as well. And even though they're engaging a lot of community groups, there are multiple points of entry for people who are very technical, uh, researchers at universities, and people who are not technical at all. And the group uh, has workshops and hands-on events and experimental tools uh, in multiple cities throughout the country, uh, throughout the United States, and in fact, throughout the world. Some of their first few workshops and events were held in Lima, Peru, where they worked with school kids to map uh, communities on the outskirts of the city. So today, I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about what makes this particular community tick and what I love about it. And I hope by the end, you really see some value in the way this organization operates, and perhaps take some of these tips and processes home to your own communities and, and think about how people in your group, uh, how can you, you can motivate them and get them to contribute. 
So first of all, it's, uh, it's a totally open community of contributors. I think probably the, the, the biggest feeling that I came away with when I first joined them was you are invited, uh, which also happens to be the name of one of my favorite songs. Is anyone familiar with a DC host? Punk? Yes. <laughs> Uh, and they're a completely welcoming group. Uh, there are very few barriers to entry. They're really just looking for people who are curious, enthusiastic, have a deep connection to a particular place, have identified some kind of issue that they want to collect data about, uh, or map, or chart, uh, and, and uh, you know, a real um, uh, passion for sharing the results of whatever data collection or experiment they run. So instead of conferences, this group has barn raisings. And this is a concept that I absolutely love. They're very much a part of the maker movement. Um, and so during these barn raisings, there are some talks about the latest experiments, the latest Kickstarter project, different community groups they're working with. But they spend a lot of time getting folks making their tools better, contributing to some of their open source software projects, uh, eating really good food and uh, boat rides every afternoon. And these um, barn raisings take place in Louisiana, where the group is still doing a lot of work with environmental groups and community groups. Um, so I think for almost everyone I know who's volunteering with the public lab, the point of entry tends to be one incredible staff person who makes a connection and follows up and follows up and follows up and finds out what you're interested in and helps you figure out how best you can contribute to the community. And for me, this is a woman named Liz Berry. Uh, Liz has been my contact at the public lab from day one. Uh, she's incredible, tireless, and she's one of those rare people who can solve really complex technical problems on her feet with a crowd of people around her and simultaneously communicate what she's doing in a really accessible way. Um, so if you ever see a workshop with Liz Berry attached to it, um, definitely, definitely attend. She's, a, she's an amazing open community advocate. So another great thing about the public lab is that all of the data that the community members collect, mostly in the form of aerial images, uh, but, but also some other environmental data is, com is completely open. They really encourage community members to put the data up on the public lab platform, to tag it, to share it, uh, to take research notes, to get other people looking at it and contributing to it. And this kind of makes up for the range of technical skills within the group because you have a lot of eyes on data that's being collected. It also makes it really appealing to academics. You've got these crowds, you've got this crowdsource data collection happening uh, all over the world. Another really cool thing, they're not afraid to try some crazy stuff, even if it doesn't work. So what I'm going to show you later today is this uh, set of tools they developed for gathering aerial images using balloons or kites. This was one of their first Kickstarter projects that really got the community off the ground. And it's dead simple. It's a huge balloon some kite string on a reel, a bunch of zip ties, rubber bands. You make a camera rig with a cranberry juice bottle. I'll show you in a minute. Tuck a camera in, launch it, and start taking aerial images. Uh, and it, it, people went crazy for it. It was an incredibly successful Kickstarter project. So they're starting to develop some more advanced tools, uh, different ways to filter images and, and uh, collect more complicated imagery with that camera that's, that's in the air. Um, they work with a lot of environmental groups, uh, uh, as I said before, but also um, small farmers who might be interested in gathering data about vegetation on their property. Uh, so this is their latest Kickstarter. It's a technique for um, combining different types of filtered images to develop a representation of a vegetation index. They have a web app for this that's a Flask project and they're looking for contributors. I'll get back to that too. 
Another great thing about this community, they work really hard to develop chapters all over the world. Um, many of you who are familiar with the Boston Python workshop, you know that Jessica McKellar and Ashish Leroy have worked really hard to spread that model city to city to city with a lot of hands-on work, personal visits, and they've been ambassadors for their own project. The same kind of thing happens in the public lab. They really try to identify people in different cities or communities who might step up, own a project, lead a workshop, and provide a lot of support for them. And each city has a different kind of focus or flavor. So in Philly, we're not doing a ton of work with environmental monitoring right now. We're a very new chapter in the public lab community. So we're doing a lot of hands-on workshops and just getting people familiar with what the public lab is. This is a workshop that we taught along the Delaware River in Philadelphia. We had teachers, geographers, lawyers, developers, uh, artists, you name it. My favorite was this woman who's a software engineer for a financial firm. We had a wait list for the event. She found out she got a spot the night before. She called her boss at 10 p.m., took an emergency sick day, came to the event the next day. She said she had to get away from her computer and she wanted to know more about open source. We've also done some workshops with kids. And what's great about balloon mapping in particular is that it's a really kid-friendly activity. Um, and believe me, the kids ask great questions. This was a workshop I did with a group of third and fourth graders. They were really engaged. Uh, they spelled out the name of their, their school when the balloon got up in the air. So, you know, I thought that maybe third grade would be a little too young for them to understand some of these concepts like open source or even the science of uh, uh, mapping, but they asked amazing, amazing questions. They really seemed to understand it. Um, when I brought the balloon down and deflated it, one third grade girl said, oh wow, why is the air coming out of the balloon colder than the air around me? And I was just blown away by the amazing observations that these kids were making. Uh, so all of the software, you know, we focused on some of the hardware tools that the public lab is creating, but all of their software tools are open as well. Um, and some of these, these um, tools that they've made for combining images and processing them uh, are, they have one that's a web-based tool where you can upload images um, uh, and derive that vegetation index or representation of that vegetation index. It's a Flask app. They also have a command line Python tool for that. Um, all of this is up on GitHub, and again, they're looking for contributors. For the most part, they're not a community of, of developers. They're mostly Python dabblers or Ruby dabblers, so they're always on the lookout for folks who can help them grow, grow their tools. Uh, so a platform to build these collaborations. And the platform isn't just the GitHub account. It's not just the Public Lab website. It's the entire network. It's that community of people who are building the public lab all around the world. So what, what can we learn from this? What can we take away? Python community is a, a little different, but I think that we can learn some lessons from the public lab. So first, engage researchers, not subjects. And I think we already do a pretty good job of this. People are interested in their own projects, but if you want to really build a community and get people contributing, you have to engage other developers. You have to engage people who are outside of the community and need a way in. Pull complexity off the shelf. So in this particular case, I'm going to go back to the low cost, dead easy hardware projects. Um, we're not talking about sophisticated tools. We're talking about simple but very successful hacks for getting things working. In this case, a tiny knot with a rubber band wrapped around it, holding down the shutter on the camera so that it can take images repeatedly. In this particular case, we ordered our balloon mapping kit, but it didn't show up, and we wanted to launch a camera, so <laughs> we just blew up a bunch of balloons, enough to lift that off the ground. Build in openness and accountability. I mean, this is good for communities like Python. It's good for families, it's good for governments. I think we'd all like to see more of this in our lives. Uh, so what's great about the balloon is that it's tethered to a human being. It's data collection out in the open. It's not about surveillance. And I always, always get this question. 
sorry guys, mostly from men, hey, that balloon's really cool and you're, you're taking images, but why not a drone? Let's go with a drone. Like, let's have total control over this image taking and be able to fly it in and out of places. And, uh, you know, and that's cool, uh, I guess. The technology is kind of interesting, but, uh, and you know, there's the taco copter. Um, but drones kind of freak people out, even when they're used as playful gadgets and not weapons of mass destruction. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, and it's, it's uh, really, the public lab is about being open and communicative with the people around you and not being um, secretive about the data collection process. Uh, so create collaborative workflows. Public lab does this really well. Um, they train people coming into the community how to take images, collect data, get it up on their various platforms so other folks can look at it. Um, when you take the aerial images from your camera and upload them to a public lab tool, they have other open source tools that let you stitch them together collaboratively so that you could make a map output it in any number of formats, uh, or use it to contribute to something like OpenStreetMap. All of the projects are on the public lab site, and they encourage folks to write research notes as well. Some of these are very, very technical. And some of them are really simple notes like, oh, I have to remember uh, to keep the cap on the helium canister, because it would be bad if I kicked it over. And did, or, um, oh, I created this really cool reel for holding the kite string so I don't have to burn my hands when the rope pulls out. So all of this is shared here. Uh, and, and they're really on top of maintaining the, the archives of data that, that folks are, are storing on their site. Um, so um, what's, what's neat about this aerial imagery uh, is that it's, it's not... Um, a commercial provider like Google. Uh, you know where the data came from. It's identified as public lab data, even the images that have been incorporated into Google Earth. Um, and it's, the community owns it and can do anything with it. Everybody owns it. It's not just something that, that Google has created. Um, and, and so in this way, the public data archives enable transparency and accountability. Uh, and again, for the folks who are doing research, uh, looking for pollutants in water, it, the images are there, uh, thousands and thousands of images for different groups to analyze, uh, and, and it really can paint a picture of an environmental problem in a particular place. Uh, so their licensing is kind of interesting. Um, the uh, folks who um, founded the public lab, uh, I think, were really involved in creating the first open hardware license. Um, and they're pretty transparent uh, uh, about the licenses and what, and what they mean, especially for folks who are new to the community. Another really cool thing, local versions of the tools. So they go into this community building, understanding that every city will have its own flavor, will want to tackle its own projects. And by encouraging all those groups to contribute back by posting research notes, posting images, the community grows, ideas go upstream and downstream, uh, and, and it, it just flourishes. And most importantly, you know, have fun. Uh, this has worked tremendously for the public lab. This is my buddy Sean and my five-year-old daughter Mia, five years old, 35 years old. Can you see a difference in their faces here? <laughs> uh, plus, I mean, the shadow games that you can create here are pretty incredible. Um, my friend Andrea calls this uh, horse downward dog on a yoga ball. So I'd like to blow up one of the balloons for you. Uh, uh, so I have to admit, this is a little bit of a, a, a party trick. <laughs> We're not going to really do much data collection now, um, but I can take a little video uh, of everyone in the room from maybe about 10, 10 feet up. What I'd like to do tomorrow um, during the first day of sprints is to try to do some aerial imagery uh, on a part of the University of Toronto campus. <clears throat> Thank you.
I think there are already some public lab folks here in Tor Toronto, but this is an, another way to contribute to the Toronto community and to get some of you started as public lab contributors. Uh, and plus, it'll be a lot of fun. So, um, you ready? All right. <laughs> uh, this is actually more nerve-wracking than live coding in front of a group, so I hope I do this. So this is the balloon. It's really big. Uh, you want to feel it? It's pretty. And this kit right here, this is, this is from their first Kickstarter project. So, um, yeah. So what I have here, as I said, this is going to be tethered to me, right? So it's completely clear that I'm the one flying the balloon. If you feel like your privacy is invaded, just look down the line and find me. And this is best done with a helper, Andrew. <laughs> OK. so. One thing we have volunteers do at first, if you want to hold that, right. is get them used to dealing with a helium. Uh, right? There's nothing dangerous here, but it's a little alarming. And for many people, this is the first time they've ever done anything with a tank of, of gas. Um, even in high school chemistry, you were kept far away from the tanks of gases. So we don't have a valve here. Um, which kind of alarmed the guy. I got this from a welding shop. Here, he said, you don't want a valve? What are you doing? Um, so, the, yeah. so the public lab folks were really thoughtful when they put this kit, kit together. They um, included all kinds of zip ties and rubber bands. Do you want to fasten that? Yeah. OK. So. I mentioned that they really work hard to provide educational tools on their website. Um, so when I slip this camera in here, I'm putting it in with this crazy, simple rubber band harness that's just a bunch of rubber bands tied together. <laughs> There's a guy named Matthew Lippicott in the public lab who has six videos about how to do this. I watch them over and over and over and over and over and over again, try to figure out how to do this. And I finally met Matthew Lippincott when I traveled to Portland. And I wanted to give him a hug as soon as I saw him meeting him for the first time, because I'd seen him in those videos so many times. <clears throat> I think he's used to that, because he wasn't freaked out. <laughs> OK, so just I'm going to blow up the balloon here. Uh, I'm going to put the camera on video mode. Um, we're not going to snap pictures this time. I'm going to slip the camera in the harness here. Cranberry juice bottle. My husband and daughter get excited when I'm doing flights because I buy juice and I never buy juice for them otherwise. Um, this stabilizes it in the wind. So we're going to pull this through. And once we get the balloon up, we've got a little carabiner. We're just going to hook that around the rope and then attach the camera. I hope we get that far. We don't have much time here, I think. Oh, we do? Oh. We can totally do this in 15 minutes. So let's just turn this around, because so, the balloon's going to be big. Yeah, and I'll wiggle it off. Ready? Okay, so when I blow this up, I'm going to tuck them together. And uh, we need one more zip tie. Yeah, there. Okay. So this, this gets up to five and a half feet in diameter. Um, that's pretty big. It's really, it's really challenging when you're out there on a windy day trying to blow this up. But, you know, fun. The first time I did it, I was terrified.
So it, it really depends on your, your load, obviously. Uh, if you remember the picture where they were using two cameras with different filters, obviously they'll need a bigger balloon. We've got a tiny camera here, and there's no wind. We're inside. So I need you to put your hand on top of it and hold it down. Yeah. Uh, so they call it a balloon mapping kit. Um, they have other kits if you want to do kite mapping. What do you think? Good? Are you guys feeling inspired? All right. I don't want to alarm anyone. I was alarmed when we got, almost got trapped in the elevator earlier. But we had our helium tank. Okay. So, do you have the uh, pliers? All right, great. So, the, the kit is just under $100. Um, no one's making any money, like most open source communities. <laughs> yeah. Oh, great. Uh, but they also, um, because they're awesome, they also provide on their website a list of all of the components of the kit so that if you want to buy them on your own, you're welcome to do that. But I always encourage people to buy kits from the public lab as a way to support them. Okay, so... Feel free to ask questions. <laughs> Anyone? Uh, so the, the loop, I put the end of the balloon through a loop, a ring, um, and through a series of, oh. OK, so I see my first mistake here. This won't be a problem, because we're in, we're in this room. Um, but stuff like this sometimes happens outside and you have to redo it. I got my loop caught inside the trap there. I'll just point out all of my mistakes. <laughs> so is this going to carry the camera? So this will carry the camera. Let's, um, go ahead. Pretty cool, right? My friend Sean, it says it's like panda bear. Wait, I still need you, Andrew. <laughs> All right, so now we have our balloon. Um, and at this point, if you decide to run a workshop on your own, most people are just going to be staring up at it with huge smiles on their face. And they won't notice why you fumble with the camera, like I'm going to do now. So I'm, I've got this in video mode. Um, there are a bunch of ways to do it if you're going to shoot photos continuously. Um, you can actually hack Canon camera cards, um, which is cool. The public lab folks have pretty much taken over that site uh, with all the tips and tools for um, uh, the Canon developer kit. And that's fun. Or you can do it manually. I showed that in the photo. Um, where you basically just put a knot over the, the button and hold it down. Um, either way, you get lots of really fabulous images of your face <laughs> while you're doing this. <laughs> um, that will, it's probably best to delete them, but you know, it's up to you. Okay, so right now this is in video mode and we're going to Hook this here. How strongly is it pulling up, Andrew? It's uh, enough, to care, enough to carry the camera. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it really, it, de it depends on weather conditions. Um, 
size of your camera. I was really lucky. Andrew, Andrew was supportive from day one. That's all <laughs> I'm going to say. Okay. Some people not this. Um, and sometimes I use crazy glue, depending on how I'm feeling. Uh, and whether the camera is mine or not. <laughs> That's terrible. Yeah, I, they, so on the public lab site, they recommend different types of cameras you might want to use. Um, you know, and for a while, we were doing this with a GoPro. Um, and so my friend was super protective of that, and I think built a doubly reinforced case. This is a fairly inexpensive Canon. Um, There are a couple ways you can do it. You can attach it to the loop, um, or you can have it down. Sometimes for the, you get better images if it's farther away from the balloon. It's all about experimenting. OK, so we're taking a little video, and it's mostly getting me. I'm just going to walk it around. So feel free to look up and say hi. <clears throat> Uh, one of the cool stories I like to tell about the public lab is that they used this technique during Occupy Wall Street to gauge how big the crowd was. Uh, they did it in, um, I was just talking about tr transparency, they did it in a little bit of a sneaky way. They had multiple groups carrying balloons. Only one had the camera and they just raised it a little higher. Um, but that was one way they could really get a sense of how many people were out there on a given day. In Philly, we just got a grant for a small project where we're looking at how people use open spaces in parks and plazas. Um, there are lots of summer events going on right now, so we're going to launch a balloon early in the morning and then look at how people filter into the event, where they go, where they congregate, when they leave. And we're pretty excited about that. It's like a, like a William White-style project with modern tools. Smile. So when I did this workshop with the kids, I got just the best images of them looking up. But adults, too. Does anyone have any other questions? It's in video mode right now. So there are a couple ways you can put a knot over the, uh, the camera button and hold it down. Um, you can, for, with Canon cameras, you can hack the camera card. You can put a little script on the camera card so you have a little more control over um, the intervals. <laughs> uh, but, you know, so when we do a workshop, we usually, we usually have a hardware hacking component to it, too, where people can put together their own rigs, their own rigs with a... Um, <laughs> juice bottles, uh, figure out how to tie those knots. Knot tying is a skill uh, that we've all lost and should probably practice more. <laughs> um, but then people will do things like really play around with those Canon camera cards. Um, all right. That's a great question. So the... Um, yeah, so they've created um, uh, a web app called Map Knitter. You can suck in all of those images, and you've got a, a, a base layer from Google Earth. Uh, I think you can choose another option. To <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, and there are proprietary software packages that will do that as well, they're quite expensive, and this is just an open source solution where you can basically flatten those images on, 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 on top of that base layer, stitch them together. Um, you're, it's, you're, you're geo-rectifying, so I mean it is um, spatial data.
when you export it from the system. No, this is just for fun. Tomorrow we'll take images. Yeah. Prob probably not for this. I suppose that if I were, I could if I were taking images, but. Um, if I were doing a room, I would probably use something like Photoshop to stitch the images together, or an open source version of that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> all right. Yes. Yep. So they were doing um, at that hack area earlier before they their Kickstarter. They were taking out one filter and replacing it with another. But the Kickstarter project is a camera with special filters already in place. So I think it might be over now. Uh, but they do, they do work with a lot of folks who are, um, have environmental interest, intern, uh, interests or are stewards of a particular piece of land and want to look at vegetation changes. So they're doing that data collection over time. All right. <laughs> I think I'm done here. Any other questions? <laughs> that is a good question. So the, it'll stay in here for a, a day or so. I'm going to walk this over to the Mozilla Webmaker Lab and show the kids. Um, and if I could use this tomorrow, probably, although I'll want to put more helium in it if we're going to launch it on campus. Uh, there are, I think, some research notes on the public lab site about how to recycle it, how to recapture it. I haven't tried it. I've been wasteful with my helium. Helium is expensive. There's a helium shortage. Or, yeah. um, but welding shops are a good source. And if you describe what you're doing to the welder, you'll probably make a new friend. <laughs> or the guy who owns the shop. How long before you realize um, so that innovation was not mine. I think um, I'll say now that the public lab was started by some crazy smart people from MIT. <laughs> uh, some of them might have been engineering majors, um, but just very clever, clever folks. I think what's really neat about this for me is that it's a juice bottle. And it, it works for the most part. If it's a really windy day, you might want to add a second tether and have two people fly it. But there are people experimenting with um, stabilizing devices. They're using Arduinos to do more complicated things with their, with their rig. Um, it's still better than a drone. I have not had that happen to me. But there's always a first. I hope it's not today. Sure. So um, that's what I have to. I have to. I am not quite familiar with Canadian laws, so I'll have to investigate that for tomorrow. Uh, uh, it can go up about 400 feet in the states. That's a limit. You also have to be really mindful of the airports around you. You have to be five miles from an airport. It's always a good idea to let police know if you're in a park. Park rangers know what you're doing. If you're in Texas. Maybe you don't want to do it at all. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah. So I mean, if you look at the projects on the public lab site, the 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 stitched maps are not perfect. So people gather a lot of images. They tend to do it from a fairly low altitude. Um, and you know it depends on what your objective is. If you're looking for a sus suspicious plume in a river, you don't have to have a perfect set of stitched images. And quite often, it's just collecting hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of images. And then looking at it over time, it can really get at the nature of the problem or paint a picture for you without having a, a, a perfectly undistorted image. Can you get to see the video? Yeah. Um, Later, I don't have the right cable for the camera. So that, that's, um, that's a good question. And I'm not that familiar with the folks who are doing um, 
that kind of work within the public lab, but I've seen in the Gowanus Canal in Brooklyn, there are a lot of people looking at pollutants going into the river. So they're out there during key times of the day when they think there might be something released from a, a facility along the canal. Um, uh, and, and from above, you can see white plumes in the river, and you know, there, are, there are different techniques for kind of looking at what's happening there. Yeah. Yeah, de definitely. It's um, my dad does a lot of work uh, with stream restoration in suburban areas, and there are some big companies along certain streams that are dumping stuff. In that case, it's hard. Would be really hard to fly the balloon because it's a wooded area. Um, but something like the Guanas Canal, or perhaps this beach you're talking about, where it's fairly open. Sounds like maybe it would be equivalent to swimming in the Schuylkill in Philadelphia, something no one should ever do. <laughs> Any other questions? That's a good question. So in the project that we're working on in Philadelphia, where we're monitoring how folks are using public spaces, uh, we've, we've cleared it with um, the park rangers, the nonprofits that are facilitating programming on those spaces. But we walk around with little cards to hand out to people that explain what the public lab is, what we're doing, the URL, if they want to see the images where they can go to see it. We try to answer some basic science questions. Um, I haven't had a bad experience. For the most part, people are just really curious. They're, you know, do people walking their dogs stop looking up. I, I mean, it's pretty engaging and, and non-threatening. And because I'm attached to it, I'm available to answer any questions someone might have. Do you have, so Google Maps, when it takes pictures of the public driving through the streets or whatever, they have technology that fuzzes out of people's faces. Right. Do you guys use that, or is that available to you, something like that, to fuzz out people's faces who do object to being captured on camera? want to have themselves excluded from your video. Sure. Um, I, you know, I, I'm sure that there's a discussion about this uh, either on the public lab site in the research notes. There are a couple of email channels too where people are talking about this. So I've obscured license plates, um, but I haven't I haven't had that problem. I think if I were when I'm doing the project in Philadelphia next week, if someone says I don't want to be in this image, and they were, felt strongly about it, I would probably pull the balloon down. Um, it would be difficult to track that person and then make sure that the, their faces were obscured later. But most of the time, the balloon is high enough that it would be really, really difficult to make out an in, in individual's features. Oh, you took it out? Sure. Yeah, let's see what we got. No guarantees. No guarantees here. <laughs> Yeah, you might all feel slightly ill after this, so yeah, he wants to hold the balloon. Look. <laughs> yeah, just uh, uh, watch, yeah, the chandeliers, but feel free to hold it. Um, it, gets, it gets bigger than this, quite a bit bigger, but you can feel the tug here. Yeah, the other one's probably in my hotel room. So what do we got? So I, I've done this before, and I, I've, I've had images that were just terrible, and I've had to relaunch the balloon. <laughs>
So you can imagine the first 300, 400 photos, if you don't set the interval right, are this sort of thing. So one of the fun things about doing this workshop with, with kids is that when you send it up, um, you get some really great pictures of their of faces. So this is going to be a lot of me and a lot of twirling. And if we were outside, it would be higher, uh, and we'd get some more interesting. It, it, it depends. Probably my best launch was on a perfectly still day. Um, and I was in an area with almost no tree cover. And I sent it all the way up. I sent it up 200 feet, 300 feet. And I got great images of, um, uh, of some parks. Time to go. Okay. So um, I'll send out information about a possible launch tomorrow during the sprints. If you're around, um, come find me. I, uh, if, I'll tweet it in the, the, the PyCon account. Hopefully, we'll retweet it. Um, uh, if we're not able to launch the balloon, we can practice. Uh, I'll get some juice bottles, and we can practice building the camera rigs and tying knots. <laughs> so thank you.